Greetings, Cardinal family. I'm Neely Bendapudi, and today I wanted to talk to you about one of our cardinal principles. That's D for celebrate diversity, foster equity, and strive for inclusion. As we all at this moment are thinking about how to be intentionally anti-racist, and certainly as a university, we're committed to being anti-racist, I thought that we would all benefit by listening to these wise and profound words from one of our own. You see, recently, I asked uh, Dr. Teresa Reed, Dean Reed, Dean of our School of Music, to talk to members of our President's Council, a group of advisors to me. The premise behind this was that to truly be anti-racist to celebrate diversity, we need to learn more about people, places, and experiences that may be very different from our own. And her words were so profound and so hopeful in terms of how we can come up with a new paradigm for race relations that moves well beyond tolerance for one another to genuine appreciation and friendship. And I wanted to make sure that all of you had the benefit of her wisdom. Please take a few minutes to listen to Dean Reed. Thank you and go cards. Thank you again. I'm glad to share some, uh, some thoughts with you that I hope will inspire a sense of optimism and uh, a sense of possibility that transcends the racial tensions that are so prevalent in our, in our news today. And I would talk off the cuff, but in student evaluations of 20 years, I've been told that I ramble. So I am going to be reading from a script to keep me centered. So we're not here until Friday. OK, um, <laughs> so please observe a, a few things to start. Number one, I am profoundly unqualified to do this. Let me just put that out there. I head the School of Music. That's my job. Secondly, my perspective as an African-American is not authoritative. But I do believe that my perspective is, is typical. And thirdly, whether you are white or a person of color, racist systems harm all of us, despite the differing degrees to which we are aware of this fact. In August 2010, celebrity talk radio host Dr. Laura Schlesinger, popularly, popularly known as Dr. Laura, is anyone familiar with Dr. Laura? Okay, took a call from the black wife of an interracial marriage who was distressed at her husband's dismissal of his friend's racist remarks. Dr. Laura derided the caller for being hypersensitive, pointing out that black comics on HBO and famous black rappers and other entertainers use the N-word all the time. To make her point and to ask what the big deal was, Dr. Laura repeated the N-word several times in rapid succession for her national radio audience to hear. She asserted that if black people could use the N-word, then she should be able to use it as well. And why should anyone find this offensive? It was 2010 and Dr. Laura further lamented that even with a black president, there was, quote, more complaining than ever, end quote, from black people. That broadcast went viral, sparking quite the firestorm. Dr. Laura lost sponsorship and within days resigned from her radio show. The flashpoint around Dr. Laura's use of the N-word underscores a common dysfunctional pattern when we attempt to communicate across our differences about race. Buried within her offensive remarks and hidden within its painful impact was a very legitimate question. And I suspect that somewhere in her heart, she really wanted to know the answer. If the N-word is so offensive, why do black people themselves use it? If I were white, I would likely find it profoundly confusing, as did Dr. Laura, that black entertainers use the term and make money, while whites use the same term and lose their credibility and their jobs. If I were white, I would also likely suffer from a sort of blindness intrinsic to the privilege that characterizes my very existence. It would be enormously difficult for me as a white American to comprehend how my own critical knowledge gaps 
help to fuel the racial discontent that fills our news and makes race so hard to discuss. So today I want to talk about two paradigms, the first of which fails us repeatedly, and a new paradigm that I believe holds promise for moving us all closer to the table of brotherhood that Dr. Martin Luther King described in his dream in 1963. So the graphic that's up, um, if you would go to the prior one, the prior slide shows the old paradigm. Yes, the current paradigm, um, which illustrates why race uh, conversations about race are either repeatedly stalled or are difficult to have at all. And I should pause here and mention that everybody got, um, thanks to Jake Beamer, a collection of materials as an email attachment and the slide deck that's only two slides um, is also in those uh, materials. So the graphic represents the current paradigm, which illustrates why conversations about race are either repeatedly stalled or difficult to have at all. So if we look at the cycle included in the paradigm, we start with a knowledge gap, which goes, goes to uh, a flashpoint. And then after that, there is an outcry followed by a consequence. And there is a retreat and an abandonment. And then we end up back where we started with the knowledge gap. The case of Dr. Laura matched all five phases of this cycle. Here is a white woman who meets every metric for membership in this country's elite, yet she suffers from an acute deficiency in her knowledge about the dynamics of race. In speaking with her caller, she exposes her knowledge gap, expresses her curiosity, and asks, albeit offensively, a very legitimate question about the racial disparity in usage of the N-word. Curiosity about race often comes from a genuine place with all good intentions and a simple desire to know. However, because there have never been any educational structures to inform white people and equip them with the interpersonal and conversational skills necessary to present their curiosity or to formulate or contextualize their questions or to otherwise safely and appropriately expose gaps in their knowledge, many white Americans with even the best and noblest of intentions have no way of gauging the impact of what they express. However, innocently that query may have originally form been formulated. This is exactly what happened when Dr. Laura expressed her confusion and curiosity about why she couldn't use the N-word. When her radio audience heard her defiant, repeated use of the N-word, Black listeners, not exclusively, but in particular, experienced her discourse as an attack, a flashpoint that triggered a reaction, not just to that particular broadcast, but a reaction grounded in a broader context of centuries old trauma with which that particular word has long been associated. So if you look at the graphic, we start with the knowledge gap, the result of exposing that knowledge gap is a flashpoint. And then off to the side, there is a reference to a 400 year history of both visible and invisible trauma. So just hold that in place. There was an outcry, followed by the consequence that Dr. Laura's show lost General Motors as a sponsor. Finally, she retreated by quitting her show and in public, at least, abandoning her curiosity, which brought us right back around to the knowledge gap that she started with in the first place. The tragedy here is that if Dr. Laura is brave enough to expose her knowledge gap again, or if she happens to do so unintentionally in the run of conversation, unless something changes, this cycle is likely to repeat. When we speak about race-based educational disparity in this country, the traditional assumption is that people of color are exclusively on the losing end of the spectrum. We usually reference the historical denial of educational access and opportunity to people of color and inequity that the Brown v. Board of Education decision of 1954, for example, was intended to help correct. The troubling racial and political polarization in our country today, however, makes it abundantly clear that deficiencies in education have impacted our country 
in much more widespread and complex ways. Until now, relatively little attention has been given to race-based educational disparity from the opposite lens. While Black Americans begin to study, learn, and practice the histories, the norms, expectations, and worldviews of whiteness from birth, an immersive, multi-directional education that we get from nearly every type of consumption from school to popular culture and mass media, and from the experience of navigating through every dimension of upward mobility, white Americans, in turn, get virtually nothing of a comparable education about Blacks and people of color. Our country's power structure makes it not only possible, but in some ways advantageous even, for white Americans to ascend to the most prominent levels of educational, political, economic, and military achievement with little to no exposure or experience that properly informs them about people of color. The problem, therefore, isn't simply racism. The problem is widespread ignorance. Through no fault of their own, white Americans are born into and suffer for much of their lives from a state of educational bankruptcy when it comes to understanding the histories and perspectives of Blacks and other people of color and moving beyond stereotypes to make real sense of why we do the things we do. To fix this, let's embrace a new paradigm. So if you would go to the next slide. I'll talk through these captions and then we'll actualize this. So there is the knowledge gap and flashpoint, but instead there I, I say whole space for the flashpoint because there is again that 400 year history of visible and invisible trauma that we'll talk about in a second. But instead of going straight to outcry, we do something different. We go to what I call risk, teach, and learn. And then from there, clarity and understanding, which leads to empathy, trust, and, and friendship. And I say friendship because I think we've gotten it wrong. For a long time, the conversation has been about tolerance. But when it comes to human beings, I think tolerance is a pretty low bar, and I think that we can do better than that. So, in my mind's eye, I've replayed the scenario with Dr. Laura again and again, and I've imagined a different kind of exchange, and as a result, a different outcome. I imagined that through some weird and unlikely turn of events, I'd actually have the opportunity to meet Dr. Laura face to face. In reality, there is no way or reason that our paths would ever cross, but work with me, I'm just kind of using my imagination. Maybe I'd run into her at the airport and our flights are canceled, and we're both trapped there with lots of time and drinks and snacks and no place else to go. So I imagine myself striking up a conversation with her because despite her debacle of 2010, I actually like her as a person and I see her humanity. I'd introduce myself, put her at ease, buy her a cup of coffee, and I gently guide her back to her unanswered question from 10 years ago. So Laura, what I heard you saying is that you'd really like to know why black people get away so easily with using the n-word, right? Legitimate question. I gently touch her shoulder, maybe reassuring her that curiosity is a good thing and that it's safe and okay to ask. And I take my time with the good explanation that she deserves because race is a topic too sensitive and complex to address in a sound bite or a factoid or in a few politically correct cliches. As her newfound friend, I would give her a clear, thorough, and non-judgmental explanation to resolve her confusion as to why African Americans use the N-word sometimes, but she cannot. And I would give her an explanation using this analogy. Imagine that your two legs are exactly the same, except that one leg is encumbered and the other one is not. One leg is free and flexible with the ability to bend and move and dance however it wills. The other leg, however, is bound by a 400 pound ball and chain that is excruciatingly painful to drag along. Every effort to move that leg is a reminder of all that burdens, oppresses, and constricts it. The N-word is linguistically unique in this country in that it derives its meaning most powerfully 
not from its etymology, nor from context, nor from vocal inflection, but it derives its meaning most strikingly from the person who utters it. When African Americans use the N-word, it is completely deracialized. That is to say that the sting and the poison are absent. When used by Blacks, the N-word can have a range of meanings and can even be a lighthearted term of endearment. It's a norm of African American culture to redefine and repurpose, and this is evident in our cuisine, in the way that we do religion, certainly in our music, and in our use of language, whatever is at hand to serve creative or expressive function. In the same way that we've transformed, for example, pig intestines into a coveted delicacy, we call them chitlins, Language has also been at our disposal to flip on its head, turn inside out, and make it mean what we want it to be. That freedom and flexibility is uh, an, an African-American expression is like the flexibility and fluidity of the unencumbered leg in our two-leg analogy. I would explain further to Dr. Laura that when someone white utters the N-word, by contrast, its meaning instantly transforms. When spoken by a white voice, the N-word automatically triggers the history of oppression at the hands of white hegemony and the resulting inequality that persists through to the present day. Upon white utterance, the N-word connects to the brutality of bondage and the heartbreak of families splintered and spouses and children bought and sold as chattel during slavery, to Jim Crow segregation that persisted through the 1960s, to redlining and real estate, to lynching, to mass incarceration, police brutality, voter suppression, and other painful realities of past four centuries, the impacts of which are still felt today. That's the other leg in our two-leg analogy, the one bound by the heavy ball and chain. So you see, Laura, I would explain, this is why your use of the N-word was so problematic. But I forgive you because you were disadvantaged by a system that did not properly teach you, and therefore you simply didn't understand. I imagine that over coffee, both of our cups now refilled for a second and third round. Dr. Laura and I are continuing our conversation, and we're beginning to let our guards down as she feels free to follow up on another one of her comments during her infamous radio rant. She feels that our discussion is safe, so she asks, you know, in 2010, Barack Obama was president. I thought black people would be satisfied, but they seemed angrier than ever. Instead of complaining, why didn't black people just celebrate such wonderful progress? Some questions may appear so naive as to sound insulting, and it may take effort for me to resist the pattern of perceived attack that activates the other phases of the dysfunctional cycle thereby threatening to abruptly end our conversation, derail our new friendship, and stall the progress of dialogue in a pothole of hurt, anger, and distrust. Again, that old pattern really doesn't get us anywhere. So I make a different choice. And I make this choice because it is only for myself that I have the power to choose. And at times it may feel counterintuitive and may take real purpose-driven effort. I then explained to Dr. Laura that while we certainly celebrated this important first, Barack Obama was also distinguished as the only president whose American citizenship was challenged in a series of ongoing, highly publicized legal and political gestures that predated his presidency and continued for nearly his entire time in the White House. In 2004, Illinois politician Andy Martin became the first to suggest that Obama was not American. In 2008, Clinton supporters circulated emails questioning Obama's citizenship, which ultimately forced Obama to publicly release, for the first of at least two times, his birth certificate. The same year, a series of lawsuits were filed challenging Obama's eligibility for the presidency based upon doubtful citizenship. In 2009, a highly publicized Kenyan birth certificate purported to be Obama's appeared in the media and on eBay. In April 2011, Obama released his long-form birth certificate. Despite this, from 2011 to 2016, Donald Trump led the birtherism charge, questioning Obama's citizenship repeatedly during televised interviews and encouraging his base to do the same. 
Finally, in September 2016, Trump sheepishly conceded that Obama was born in America. I would say then to Dr. Laura, so you see, Obama's presidency was both an important first and a painful reminder that if you are brown in this country, you can ascend even to the presidency and still be viewed by too many as unworthy, inadequate, and imposter. I sense that Dr. Laura is neither malicious nor hateful, and she may not even be a car carrying racist. Instead, Dr. Laura's dilemma, her problem, simply put, is ignorance that she inherited from the condition of her privilege. And sitting with her here over coffee in a quiet space, I have the power, if I'm willing, to begin to address her ignorance and to help guide her in filling her knowledge gap. My imaginary exchange with Dr. Laura, where her knowledge gap is not ignored or minimized, but it's addressed and curiosity is resolved, realizes the phases in this new paradigm that I propose. Knowledge gap, they exist. Space for Flashpoint, because there's, there's stuff in there, there's some trauma. But risk, teach, and learn. Believing that the knowledge gap was not of her own creation, it's just a factor of the a system and not of people so much, which gets us to clarity and understanding. And finally, empathy, trust, and friendship. And with each repetition of this cycle in the new paradigm, the knowledge gap gets smaller and smaller and smaller over time. And that is how we chip away at racism. Many of you have read the letter that I shed, shared with my School of Music family that described a way forward on race. Since then, we've been meeting in what I call safe Saturday sessions each Saturday morning from 9 to 1030, because that's the only time that I have, on a Zoom call where anyone in the School of Music and other interested friends can safely ask anything at all about the Black experience and receive non-judgmental response. I usually begin with some framing conversation, then we open for free dialogue, and I conclude each session with a list of bare facts that afford participants points of departure for doing further investigation on their own. There are other African American colleagues from the School of Music on the call, and we share our perspectives and the information we have. Maybe I'll never get to risk, uh, maybe I'll never get to have that conversation with Dr. Laura, but I can certainly get to risk, teach, and learn with those in the unit that I serve. And in your email, the other materials that you have are materials from the first three of our Safe Saturday sessions that include answers to some questions and then the fact list for each week. The first question we dealt with the N-word, the, the first week we dealt with the N-word. The second week, I think we talked about identity and naming. So people wanted to know, what do you call black people? And so we did just like a really brief history lesson on that. Um, the last week we talked about diversifying organizations and their list of questions around that. So that's just a, a Zoom call anybody uh, can join. So where do we go from here? If you're someone white who finds yourself ready to access the information and the education about the black experience that you never received, what can you do? First of all, be okay with not knowing. It's, it's not your fault. You must recognize that racist structures depend on two things for their survival, the perpetuation of inequity and the perpetuation of misinformation. A racist system works both by denying opportunities to people who look like me and by denying education about me to people who look like you. Secondly, notice the black people in your circle. And if there are no black people in your circle in 2020, ask why that is. If you have no black friends, I will be your friend. But notice that black people in your circle have to some degree, whether it's apparent or not, there is some degree of trauma there. Black communities and black people suffer today from long-standing, deeply entrenched inequities established during slavery. Most recently, the national news has reported on the killings of unarmed blacks. But just two weeks ago, uh, there was property vandalized with racist graffiti near my sister's neighborhood here in Louisville, a neighborhood that I pass at least once a week. Whether the trauma is from something widely reported or from the microaggressions we experience in the course of more routine activities, 
Many African Americans learn to hold it inside and keep it moving. Like our parents, grandparents, and other ancestors before them, we've learned to suppress trauma and move forward with our lives, achieving what we can, however we can, often drawing motivation from something greater than ourselves, like family or community and faith. I finished undergrad 33 years ago, and my parents still don't know what it was like for me to be black at an all-white university. And they don't know because their example and my grandparents' example and my great-grandparents' example taught us to hold it inside, taught me to do the same thing. But you should assume that there is some element of trauma there. Recognize that more than anything else, Black people simply want you what you want, and that is to be understood. Because if we're understood, then we won't have to convince anyone that our lives matter. Courageously recruit the Black people in your life to be your teachers and facilitators by saying these words. I don't understand. I want to understand. Please help me to understand. In so doing, you destroy a wall, you create a friendship or you deepen an existing one, and you change the world. So I started this talk with the story of a white woman, Dr. Laura, and I'll end my talk today with the story of another white woman whose life and work illustrates the power of daring to engage a worldview that differs from one's own. The year 1850 saw the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, a terrifying law that criminalized harboring escaped slaves even if they lived in free states. This law incentivized not only the capture and re-enslavement of blacks who had made it to freedom, but also the abduction and sell into slavery blacks who were freeborn and had never been slaves at all. Outraged by this law, a white woman and New England native whose family members were outspoken, outspoken abolitionists picked up her pen to write. Part of her inspiration came from the slave narrative of Josiah Henson. Excuse me a moment. On June 5th, 1851, the first installment of Harriet Beecher Stowe's story appeared in a newspaper called The National Era. Published in serial form, the newspaper published installments of the story over the next several months after its initial appearance. And her story became a powerful anti-slavery message, the impact of which she could not have possibly fathomed. In 1852, the completed work was published as the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin. Written in the parlance of its times, the book certainly contains language and perhaps stereotypes that without question would be unacceptable according to modern standards. This notwithstanding, there is absolutely no way to argue against the fact that Uncle Tom's Cabin spoke powerfully to 19th century sensibilities about the evils of slavery in a way that no other book did. This book became, this book became not only the single most important anti-slavery publication of the antebellum era, era, but perhaps the single most important American literary work of the 19th century period, selling in the United States fewer copies than only the Bible. Harriet Beecher Stowe's commitment to freedom for black people as expressed in Uncle Tom's Cabin was her most important and impactful legacy. Uncle Tom's Cabin changed the entire national discourse on blacks in America. It exposed the horrors of slavery and sparked new critiques of the slaveholding South, igniting new arguments in favor of abolition that before her novel did not exist. The defenders of slavery hated Harriet Beecher Stowe, and they went to great lengths to discredit her work. Nonetheless, the essential message of the book, that slavery is wrong, was delivered with resounding success to a public ready to hear it. And Uncle Tom's Cabin inspired a bevy of other artistic creations, from plays to other literary works, later to movies and to songs, including this one widely considered in its day to be an anti-slavery ballad. 
Its lyrics depict the scene in the novel that every 19th century listener would have immediately understood having been drawn from, uh, would have immediately understood as having been drawn from Harriet Beecher Stowe's book. You might have heard it. It goes like this. The sun shines bright on my old Kentucky home. Tis summer, the people are gay. The corn tops ripe and the meadows in the bloom while the birds make music all the day. Have you heard that before? Drawing inspiration from Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, which by the way was set in Kentucky, Stephen Foster composed My Old Kentucky Home in 1853, the year following the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin. The original lyrics of the song included the term darkies, which in its day was considered more polite than the much more widely used N-word. Be warned, if you read anything from American literature or popular culture of a century or more ago, you will find a wealth of racist language. As scholars and historians, we view these works in the context of their times. We no more expect Harriet Beecher Stowe or Stephen Foster to meet our standards of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, any more than we would expect for King James to have translated the Bible into 21st century American English. Yet we know that images and words have power and we're careful to avoid glorifying and perpetuating that which contradicts our values as an enlightened society. Recognizing this in 1986, the state of Kentucky approved an adaptation of the song that removed the archaic term darkies from its lyrics. Let's not forget though, that Frederick Douglass himself described and praised my old Kentucky home as one of the songs one of the many songs, one of the many expressions inspired by Harriet Beecher Stowe's work that awakened sympathies for the slave and for abolition. In Harriet Beecher Stowe's day, it was popular literature that had the power to expose societal evils and sway public opinion in the direction of justice. Here was a white woman of education and means who could have easily enjoyed a life of leisure and blissful ignorance, safely sequestered within the boundary of her privilege, but she took a risk and she changed the world. In the 1950s and 60s, it was television that had the power to expose societal evils and sway public opinion in the direction of justice, bringing us images of peaceful protesters stumbling beneath the weight and force of water hoses and vicious attack dogs. And in 2020, it's the smartphone that has the power to expose societal evils and sway public opinion in the direction of justice, bringing us images of unarmed African-Americans gasping for breath beneath the weight of an officer's knee. So let's join together to create new images for our descendants. Let's tackle our knowledge gaps together. Let's be brave in the face of our flashpoints and triggers and our trauma, and let's adopt a new paradigm and get to risk, teach, and learn and create a better world. Thank you. I should reiterate that I'm no expert. Um, <laughs> I have no credential or, or qualification. I think um, that uh, the, there is much more expertise with my colleague Faye Jones, who's here. Um, but we are at a unique moment, I believe, in our history. It's, it's a different moment that I think is intensified by COVID uh, because COVID requires us to be detached from one another. So. We, we can't even have uh, normal conversations about uh, normal things, but that as an additional layer to the racial unrest in this country really intensifies our ability to navigate this differently, I think, than, than at any other point in this history. So um, the, the commitment to getting on the other side of this, not just on the other side of COVID, but to do things differently so that we don't recycle through the same process again and again, 
Um, since uh, the, the death of Trayvon Martin, we've kind of seen the pattern of the old paradigm activated several times where there's really a, an event that brings to the surface this trauma that I'm talking about, which exposes knowledge, gap, knowledge gaps, which leads to an outcry with, uh, and flashpoint, an outcry. And then there is offense inevitably that causes us to retreat and back away from each other. But I'm, I'm hopeful now that we do something other than back away from each other. Uh, you're asking whether Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, if read with a 21st century lens, would be considered objectionable. That's, that's correct. Okay. And I would say yes, if. And say. it would be considered objectionable if it's read with a 21st century yardstick and decontextualized, if it's taken out of its native time and transplanted into 2020 in accordance with the things that we know are acceptable and unacceptable. If we remove that book from its historical placement and we transplant it into a historical placement that does not fit it, then it would be highly offensive. And here is where a liberal arts education is extremely important because what the liberal arts education does is give you the skill set to contextualize and synthesize and understand how history and literature and art and social sciences and all that stuff come together to give the backdrop that makes sense out of what we're reading. So if I were to treat Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel as an artifact of my own time, then the outcome of how the reaction would be there would be completely different than the reality of how 19th century readers read it. And therein lies the problem. There's been a, a, a lot of literature uh, really kind of castigating Uncle Tom's Cabin because it's filled with stereotype and it has it's rife with racist language and all of that. But let's consider a few things. First of all, in the 1850s, Harriet Beecher Stowe was incredibly unique as someone who was able to present a narrative that was recognizable even to somebody like Frederick Douglass, who had been a slave. So he did not object to her book because he too was a part of those times. And so if we understand, I use the analogy of, of the Bible. Nobody in everyday language today says thee and thou and art and we don't talk like that anymore, right? That's because in his time, King James had a single linguistic toolkit, and that was 16th century English. If we were to indict King James for not writing, for not translating the Bible into 20th century American English, that would be very odd because 20th century American English didn't even exist at the time that the Bible was translated. Right. I use that analogy to make the point that to her readers, Harriet Beecher Stowe's writing fit within the common parlance of that day and would not have been found offensive. The other point is to not miss the forest for the trees. So if we back away from the minutia that might be considered offensive and look at the impact and the bigger story of what she wrote, then you have to honor what she achieved. And what she achieved was that she sparked the conversation about abolition that without which I might not be here today. So that that's the, the part of, of contextualizing that piece of literature properly so that we don't indict it unfairly. And also realizing that there were African-Americans who spoke in the same parlance. Uh, James Bland was a composer who wrote, uh, take me, carry me back to old Virginia. Another a similar, very sentimental song that became the state song of Virginia and that had some of the same objectionable language in it. And if you want to complicate that even further, there are recordings of the famed contralto Marian Anderson singing Carry Me Back to Old Virginia with the original lyrics. What do you do with that one? So there again, you have to be, you, you have to have the, the, the savvy to contextualize these artifacts of history, thinking about their impact and to whom they were speaking in their day 
while understanding that it may not be appropriate to translate or to, to copy and paste those works into modern times without giving the proper contextualization. Well, that's a really good question. And my response is that I'm not so sure we really understand the history properly. We, we're not sure we understand. I'm, I'm not entirely sure we understand the history properly. Okay. Because if I were to ask about the Washington, D.C., for example. Washington, D.C.? If I were to bring that topic up, many Americans don't know that the White House and most of the early federal buildings were constructed by slave labor. The White House was built by African American, overwhelmingly by African American free and slave labor. The early federal buildings constructed overwhelmingly by African American free and slave labor. Many of the colleges and universities that have really begun to look carefully at their architectural histories are finding that those buildings were constructed by free and slave African American labor. And there's this other history that has not been entirely unearthed. So that's part of our dilemma is that when we get a telling of history, inevitably we get it told with a bias. And that's human nature, we all do that, right? So the folks who had the literacy and the ability to create narrative and transmit narrative were not the people who were building things. They were not the people who were picking cotton. They were not the people who were paving roads and picking tobacco and building railroads. They were the people who had the access and the means and the privilege to put those narratives forward as the authoritative ones. It's only now that with more access to information and literacy and technology, it's only now that we're able to see that there's another side. So the problem though does go back to our old paradigm. Let's take that issue of toppling a statue. If you go back to the old paradigm, it, it fits exactly this cycle that we're talking about. So there, there is a, a knowledge gap. And I'm gonna use as an example, a pretty common one. Uh, let's use the example of Christopher Columbus. So um, I was taught like most people my age that Christopher Columbus was a hero who discovered America. And there are many monuments around this country, whether they be statues or paintings or other kinds of tributes to Christopher Columbus for that wonderful achievement. But that telling alone is indicative of a pretty profound knowledge gap because the other data, the other history, the other facts, set of facts that we have is that Christopher Columbus also can, we can point to him as being kind of responsible for uh, famine and disease and impoverishment and displacement of Native American and indigenous communities in this country. And he also participated in the slave trade under the Portuguese flag. So there's this whole other side of Christopher Columbus that really doesn't give us a balanced picture of who he was. So when people topple that statue, you know, there's a flashpoint around that because the folks that Christopher Columbus was told, you know, that he was a hero, the selection of Christopher Columbus as a hero was made without the input of many of the people whose lives were impacted by his choices. Therefore, there's some trauma there, there's a flashpoint, and then we go straight to outcry, let's knock over the statue. The problem there is not that the statue is retained or not down. The problem is that we don't know enough about it to make sense of it, so it seems abrupt, it seems disrespectful. Even with the argument that the toppling of Confederate statues is disrespectful to our country, is really indicative of a real knowledge gap because Confederate soldiers were not advocating for our country. They were advocating for the Confederacy, which was a different country. They were in fact opposing this country. So they were enemies of this country. And yet in that case, we have narratives that are crafted both on knowledge gaps and on cognitive comfort more than on fact.
So in antebellum times, it was very common for slave owners to refer to adult women as girls and adult men as boys. And so if we look at the collection of labels that were affixed to enslaved Africans, um, in the hand, one of the handouts that you have, I have a collection of them there. I won't repeat them because they are objectionable. But there are some, uh, one of the terms uh, that was used not only to um, address enslaved Africans, but to address them in a particular way that minimized their value, minimized their legitimacy, minimized their intelligence, minimized their humanity, was to refer to adult men and women as though they were children. That reference, boy, girl, for adult black men and adult black women, survived and was common in uh, the sharecropping era, the, in which covers a really big span of history. Following the end of slavery, the reconstruction period was a period during which many African Americans who had been, slave, had, had been slaves had no option but to continue sharecropping on the same land where they had been enslaved. And very often they had children on that land and their children had children on that land and so forth and so on. So that well into the 1960s and 70s even, you can find some, flam some families in the South who trace their ancestry to enslavement on exactly the same land where they were sharecropping. What resulted from that was a new kind, was, was really slavery by a different name because the sharecropping system meant that those African Americans were perpetually indebted. So the obvious question is, well, why didn't they leave? Well, they didn't leave because they were charged for tools and for seed and for animals. They were charged to work the land, which created a system of perpetual and cyclical indebtedness, which meant they could not leave unless they escaped in the middle of the night. And we're talking about the 1940s, 50s, 60s. So the dynamics between the white landowner and originally white landowner and slave, but then white landowner and sharecropper remained pretty much the same, so that well into the middle of the 20th century, if you wanted to denigrate someone who was African American and reinforce that inferiority, you would find it pretty common for a, a well-baked, fully adult male to be referred to as a boy and an African American woman to refer, be referred to as a girl. So that's the history behind that, and that's the reason why those terms might be offensive. Now, in context, it's not necessarily offensive. So if I walk over to Faye and I say, hey girl, how you doing? That's a completely different contextualization because we are peers and we are not, that's a deracialized de contextualization. And if you are, if you're white and you walk up to me or to Faye and you use that designation, unless you have an intimate relationship with us, that's a good, solid, intimate, mutual friendship, that may not come over well, so that's, I hope I answered that question. I'm all for adding knowledge. I believe that that's our enterprise as an educational institution. And there's never a moment at which I think anything is not fair game for critique and that it's not fair game for critical analysis. And I believe that we absolutely, that's part of our our mission and our charge is to add knowledge. What we often do in this country and what we often do with the structure that we have is that we envision the real estate available for discovery as a pie. So that the pie means that if a certain slice goes to one direction, that equal amount is denied to the other direction. And we, you know, we deal with this in academia all the time when we make decisions about what to teach. And so the, the eternal tension is between whether we should teach for depth or whether we should teach for breadth. Because if we have too much on the plate, that means if I teach, if I don't teach, uh, if I do teach, for example, about uh, American popular music, there's less room left for jazz. If I do teach about 
this history, history A, that there's left, less room left for history B. And I think that that's one of the fears that anyone who's an educator has to encounter. And I think that is similar to part of the fear connected to the prospect of adding knowledge where none exists. And one of the things that I remember very, very clearly as someone who came of age during the 80s when terms like multiculturalism and diversity were first becoming buzzwords in educational institutions was number one, the fear that people were going to be required to teach things that they didn't know. And that's terrifying for a scholar. And the secondary fear of, you know, even if we do learn this other stuff, these other histories, these other perspectives, where are we gonna fit it into the curriculum? So part of our dysfunction is an either or mentality that we either have to embrace a particular history and a particular telling and sort of hold on to that territory, or we have to swing all the way in the other direction and completely erase history A from the menu in order to treat history B. And that's really kind of a broken paradigm because it's possible to develop the skill of interrogation and critical analysis Developing that skill set means that it doesn't matter what the content is. It doesn't matter whose history it is. If we develop the skill set to interrogate fairly and objectively and critically the facts before us, then we will make the room, we'll create the room to think about our heroes in ways that make space for those who are unsung. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much.